show you some things in the scripture. But before we do that, let's pay homage to our pastor. Let's appreciate her. Let's honor her. We esteem her. We lift her. We strengthen her. We build her. We raise her. And we keep her before the throne as she talks to God in behalf of first herself and in behalf of those that she serves. Today, God, I ask you to unstop every deafened ear, open every blind eye, free every imprisoned mind, fill every which is health and life to all their flesh. May they receive this word in love. In the name of Jesus. First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through verse 22. The Amplified Version says, For indeed Christ died for sins once for all, the just and righteous for the unjust and unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty. The New Living Translation says of that, he never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God so that he might bring us to God. And back with the Amplified, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and preached to the spirits, now in prison, who were once disobedient. He also went and preached to the spirits, now in prison, who once were disobedient when the great patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that rescue through the flood baptism, which is an expression of a believer's new life in Christ, now saves you not by removing dirt from the body, but by an appeal to God for a good, clear conscience, demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven. Now he's telling you his positioning at the right hand of God, that is the place of honor and authority, with all angels and authorities and powers made subservient or lesser to him. Today I want to talk to you about getting to know Jesus and the resurrection because we can't just take communion any kind of way. The resurrection is important because it signifies the Father's power demonstrated through his only begotten Son that sin and death is conquered. This is what he demonstrated through Jesus. It encourages every believer that our faith is not in vain. It also serves as a foundation for the Christian faith, shaping believers' perspectives on forgiveness, redemption, the power of God's love, 
and the power to overcome adversity and the promise of a future resurrection for us. In other words, it gives believers hope and reassurance that there is life beyond death. We are spirit beings. You cannot kill our spirit. In other words, it gives believers hope and reassurance that there is life beyond death. It demonstrates that death is not the end, but rather a transition to eternal life with God. This belief in the resurrection empowers believers to live with purpose and confidence, knowing that their actions and choices in this life have eternal significance. So faith plays a crucial role in understanding the power of his resurrection. I often say that there are many people may have heard of Jesus, but then there's many people that have never had a relationship with the Jesus they say they heard about. For whatever reason it is that people don't have a relationship with Jesus, you and God know that. For whatever reason it is that you don't personally know him, there comes a time in every person's life where we move beyond the lowest level of spiritual ignorance. That we get beyond the lowest level of spiritual ignorance. And that is just listening to people without thoroughly researching, researching it for yourself. It is through faith that believers accept and trust in the reality. This really happened of Jesus' resurrection, even though it may seem incomprehensible or impossible. It requires trust and belief in the unseen, acknowledging that Jesus conquered death and offers eternal life. By placing trust in him and his teachings, please hear me closely, individuals can experience a deep sense of connection to God and the transformative power of his love and his teachings in our lives, in their lives, finding solace, strength, guidance, and hope in the promise of salvation. The reality, you know everyone else's teachings, but Jesus' teachings. You can even learn on your job what that job stands for. You can learn how to function in positions on jobs. And when it comes to God, he's on the back burner somewhere because you're only functioning how you saw someone else or 
heard someone else because you yourself don't know personally. So now is the hope and redemption at the core of the power of his resurrection. Through his sacrifice, Jesus provides a path for believers to be reconciled or reunited with God because the separation came through sin and without the shedding of blood, the sin remains. And this was the purpose of them bringing sacrifices to the priests in the days of old. Because God said, if they're going to be right before me, they must offer me a blood sacrifice. Jesus, the Lamb of God, he was slain because it is the blood where the life is. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You remove the blood, the flesh dies. No flesh and blood is in heaven together like that. The only blood you find the basin in front of the crystal river before the throne of God and before he can deal with man, he sees blood. So therefore, he shows us mercy every day. His mercy is renewed morning by morning. So Jesus, he provides a path for believers to be reunited or reconciled with God and experience forgiveness for their sins. This offers hope for a renewed life and the promise of eternal salvation, demonstrating the transformative and redemptive nature of his resurrection. Through his sacrifice, Jesus took upon himself the sins of of humanity, offering forgiveness, which offers a path to reconciliation with God, which is the opportunity for a renewed relationship with God. If you are actually in a relationship with the Lord, somebody say, I am in a renewed relationship with God. Because before you were renewed, you were yet full of sin. But when you accept him as your savior, he forgives you of that sin so you're no longer walking around with that stain in your life. It's only people that try to make you feel the stain. People do that. But he said, as far as the east is from the west, I have removed your transgressions. Transgression is a form or a type of sin. No different than crack is a type of drug. Methamphetamines is a type of drug. Cocaine is a type of drug. Transgression is a type of sin which suggests I know it's wrong but I'm going to do it anyhow. That's transgression. And the scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, the stuff he know you're going to do, he said, I've removed it. I didn't write it. So this is what Jesus does. He offered the opportunity for a renewed relationship with God. And this act of love and mercy gives us, or we, believers, the hope of eternal life and the redemption of our souls. The idea of Jesus 
being at the right hand of God is significant in Christian theology as it represents his exalted and powerful position. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 10, the Amplified says, In the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both specific petitions and urgent supplications for that which he needed with fervent crying and tears to the one who was always able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission toward God, his sinless and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. But people said, don't ask God. Jesus is asking his Father. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong, and God's never wrong. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the father, he learned active special obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, uniquely equipped and prepared as savior and retaining his integrity amid opposition, uniquely equipped and prepared as savior, and retaining his integrity amid opposition, he became the source of eternal salvation and eternal inheritance to all those who obey him, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek does not have a lineage. So no one can say this is his family here or there. This is the order of God in the form of high priest. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 says, And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with the light by the Holy Spirit so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people. This is Paul praying for those in Ephesus. I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that gives you a deep and personal and intimate insight in th into the true knowledge of him. For we know the Father through the Son. And so that you will begin to know what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his active spiritual power is in us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, whether angelic or human, and far above every name that is named, above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and world, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in every realm in subjection under Christ's feet and appointed him as supreme and authoritative head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills and completes all things in all believers. The book of Luke chapter 20, verse 42 through verse 43, the voice translation says, don't you remember how David himself wrote in the Psalms? Listen to this. The master said to my master, the master said to my master, sit here at my right hand in the place of honor and power, and I will gather your enemies together 
lead them in on hands and knees, and you will rest your feet on their backs. Mark says, chapter 12, verse 36, while he was teaching in the temple, Jesus asked, how is it that the religious scholars say that the Messiah is David's son? When we all know that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, God said to my master, sit here at my right hand. Sidebar, the servant is not greater than his master and never will be. Quit telling your children they're going to be greater than you. Don't tell them that no more. This is what you tell them. You're going to go beyond me. They will never be greater than you because there'll never be another you in them. There will never be another you in them. They will just go Jesus never said we'd be better than him. He just said greater works because I go to the Father. My time became limited, but now you got social media. You can go all over the world right here. Jesus couldn't do that in his day and time. Jesus never said we'd be better than him. We'd only do greater works. Because he goes to the Father. While he was teaching in the temple, Jesus asked, how is it that the religion scholars say that the Messiah is David's son? When we all know that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, God said to my master, sit here at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David here designates the Messiah, my master. So how can the Messiah also be his son? The large crowd was delighted with what they heard. He continued teaching. Watch out for the religion scholars. They love to walk around in academic gowns, preening in the radiance of public flattery, basking in prominent positions, sitting at the head table at every church function. And all the time, they are exploiting the weak and helpless. The longer their prayers, the worse they get. But they'll pay for it in the end. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 through verse 10. For in him, the fullness of deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form completely expressing the divine essence of God. And in him, you, we, have been made complete, achieving spiritual stature through Christ. And he is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. Digress to chapter 1 of the Colossians, verse 18. He is the head of this body, the church. He is the beginning, the first of those to be reborn from the dead so that in every aspect and at every view, in everything, he is first. Psalm 47, verse 1 through verse 3. Clap your hands, all of you. Raise your voices joyfully and loudly. Give honor for the true God of the universe. Here's why. The eternal, the most high, is awesome and deserves our great respect. He is the great king over everything in this world. He's helped us win wars, suppressed our enemies, and made nations bow at our feet. The Message Bible says he crushes hostile people, put nations at our feet. The New Living Translation says, he subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies under or beneath our feet. So it signifies that Jesus shares in the authority and glory of God and that all the angels, authorities, and powers are subject 
to him. We have a name if we get in trouble that we can call. If you call on Jesus, that's all you got to do is call him. All you got to do is call him. Do I have anybody in here that can call him? What is his name? Jesus. His name is Jesus. God has given us a name. This belief brings reassurance to believers as it reinforces the power and sovereignty of Jesus in our lives. Revelation 21 verse 5 says, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. Then he said to me, this is God talking to uh, Apostle Pastor John, uh, uh, yeah, well, on the Isle of Patmos. He's saying, listen, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down. So he's writing what God is telling him to write unto the church because remember, Paul is anointed to the Gentiles and the Jews and to kings and presidents and all kind of celebrities and all that kind of stuff. That's who Paul was anointed to. John was anointed to the church. He says, you tell them. Uh, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. I will be their God. They will be my children. So as we embrace our relationship with Jesus, we began to appreciate our own self-awareness. Through our self-awareness, individuals are able to cultivate a deeper understanding of themselves. When is the last time you spent time with you to know you, getting to know you? Some of you think you know you and you don't know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say you love in your heart and the, and the right the prophet already told us that our heart is desperately wicked who can know it we 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 be thinking that we know us we be saying oh well i ain't on this and i'm not going that and next thing you know there you are through our self-awareness individuals are able to cultivate a deeper understanding of themselves which in turn allows them to form more authentic and meaningful connections with others by knowing your own values, beliefs, your own values, your values, those may be somebody else's values, but what are your values? individuals can attract like-minded individuals to build relationships based on mutual understanding and respect. In other words, I, I'm getting to know you, you're getting to know me, there are beliefs, there are values, there are things that you have that I share that same type. I share that, oh, you believe that too? I believe that too. By knowing your own values, beliefs, motivations, individuals can attract like-minded individuals and build relationships based on mutual understanding and respect. This builds community. This self-awareness also enables individuals to communicate their needs, boundaries, and aspirations more effectively, fostering healthier and more fulfilling connections with others because the people you have the connection with can understand what it is that you're speaking about 
based upon a similar type of incident they have had. So that allows for there to be a connection made. This builds community. You cannot go deep and deeper without soul searching. This is a process of deep intros introspection, self-reflection in order to gain a deeper understanding of oneself, one values, and one's purpose. You'd be surprised that people don't even know why they're living. Sitting here, watching me on the stream, there are people that don't even know their purpose in life. It involves asking meaningful questions, examining one's belief and desires, and exploring one's emotions and experiences. You need some space and some time to get to know you. We must take the time to get to know Jesus and to understand who he is, what he stands for. The resurrection reveals Jesus' deep love and sacrifices, sacrifice for humanity. It allows us to gain a deeper understanding of the love and the sacrifice that he made for us. We can then learn to appreciate his place in the world and the impact he has had on our lives. This means, and I'm about to finish, we must strive to understand Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection on a personal level. We must also recognize our own worth and our identity in him. Through this, we can gain a better understanding of Jesus' place in the world. My last scripture is found in Romans chapter 8. There is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those, here it is, in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that is, the law could not overcome sin and remove its penalties or its power. There were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of different laws that they had to govern their life by. And they could not live out those laws every day. But Jesus abolished all that. You don't have to go out and kill no animal and bring the animal to the temple and all that blood be offered up on the sacrifice for the sins of you and even for the sins of your family members. Because the sin offering would be offered for the entire family. You don't have to do that anymore. Scripture tells us when he hung on the cross, the veil of the temple that separated the priest, the high priest from the people was torn from the top to the bottom. Open. People didn't have to bring their act animals Sorry. 
place no more. We take our sin to Jesus and we leave it. We walk away from it and we go the other way. Everything that you do in your life is as a result of the choices you make. What the law could not do, that is overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power, being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh, subdued it, and overcame it in the person of his own son, that the righteous and the just required requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh guided by worldliness and our sinful nature but live our lives in the way of the spirit guided by his power I know it's a whole lot of stuff that have crept in the church and I know people is coming up with their own ideologies but nothing you can come up with is higher than what has already been laid what has already been offered in blood the message of this says it and it helps us to see a little more with the arrival of Jesus the Messiah that faithful dilemma is resolved those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity, in order to set it right once and for all. The law code weakened as it always was by fractured human nature could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. There's people in this room you need to bandage off and you need to be healed whole and delivered and set free. You need to be loose, delivered, and set free. That's a choice. That's a choice. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing. Just simply embrace what the Spirit is doing. Thank you.